What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another special edition of the Bombastic Podcast presented by Natty State Sports and hosted by Andrew Ellis. And uh, we got a lot to talk about today because Arkansas made quite the statement. I believe the title of my last podcast was, Can Arkansas Make a Statement Against the Defending National Champs? I'd say they did. I'd say sweeping them in uh, impressive fashion and doing it in front of a national audience with a lot of people watching. I would say that was a uh, that was quite the statement. And, you know, it's not like they blew them out. It wasn't like a dominant three-game, you know, run rolling them a couple times or anything like that. But it was just like a really good, well-rounded sweep. It was just like a clean sweep. I mean, people say that a lot, but it's like that was just a well-rounded, they took care of business in every game, did what they had to do. Um, I guess the thing that kind of stuck out to me was just the competitive nature that was there in the game. I mean, you could tell everyone was fired up. It's a humongous crowds every game, uh, at least you know at least ten thousand in every game, and I believe the announced attendance for Friday's game set a new season high, over eleven thousand. So I mean, it was a lot of energy inside the arena or, or stadium or park or whatever you want to call it. Uh, a lot of people watching nationally because you had. Thursday's game was on ESPN2. Friday's game was on SEC Network. Uh, so there's a lot of eyeballs on this game. Obviously, you have two top 10 teams, two huge fan bases, defending national champions, maybe future national champions. It just There was a lot that added up that made this weekend and this matchup a fun one and one to watch. And uh, for me personally, selfishly, I view everything through my own lens, my own very selfish lens. Uh, it was good for me personally that Arkansas went ahead and swept LSU uh, I, I got to hear from a lot of my buddies, you know, whether it was like growing up or just people that I still talk to every day or whatever. All A lot of my best friends, like I said on last week's show, are LSU fans. A lot of their parents are LSU fans. A lot of people I went to church with. And so if Arkansas hadn't taken care of business in this series, I was probably going to be hearing a good bit. Uh, but instead, all I heard were nice things, which is good for me, uh, but also good for Arkansas. And good, good for Arkansas to put on. I mean, like I mentioned, LSU has a big fan base. Uh, a lot of people that just watch, a lot of people that just love college baseball. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to mention every LSU fan that quote unquote loves college baseball, but uh, you know, there's some good ones here, here and there. And so it's like to do what Arkansas did this weekend in front of a bigger audience like that. I feel like that was a big deal for Arkansas. And you know, games like this and series like this really prepare you for down the stretch when the tensions are going to be high, the stakes are going to be high. There's going to be a lot of people watching, pressure, pressure filled situations and. I feel like Arkansas has really risen to the occasion more often than not this season. I mean, they're twenty three and three, um, but I thought this weekend was a really good sign. I mean, we can get it. we're we're going to talk about all the the actual signs of what happened on the field and the developments that mattered because there were plenty of good, bad, and different to take away from this series. I mean, as this picture and this story of this Arkansas baseball team continues to unfold, uh, but I thought just big picture mentally, uh, it was it was good to see Arkansas come through in situations like this and rise to an occasion and. Really beat up. I mean, they they beat. I mean, it wasn't like I said, it wasn't dominant, but it felt like every time LSU made a big play or had a momentum swing of any sort, Arkansas would just punch them right in the gut and demoralize them with something else. I mean, you go look at it every single time LSU scored throughout the weekend. Arkansas either scored immediately after or quickly, shortly thereafter. Uh, like in game one, LSU takes a 2 1 lead in the fourth inning. Arkansas comes back with two of their own runs. LSU scores one run in the eighth. Arkansas scores three runs at the bottom of the eighth. Uh, I just felt like they always had answers to every problem LSU presented to them, whether that was lineup, pitching, whatever. And, uh, you know, t Tommy White is, I mean, right off the bat, if we're just going to talk about this series and what happened, Tommy White and LSU, that lineup, especially the top half of that lineup, having to navigate that however many times Arkansas had to, whatever, it was like 10, 11, 12 times throughout the weekend – that's a big deal, man, and it's really good to see your pitchers, to see Gabe Gackle have to do that, to see Will McIntyre have to come in to these big situations and get Tommy White out at the end of the game. Uh, it's just it's that kind of stuff only makes your baseball team better. And uh, speaking of making your baseball team better, I guess I, this is a good little segue here. Uh, so Hagan Smith pitched for Arkansas in Game One, and after the game, Jay Johnson, the LSU's head coach, who sucks, that guy's any any baseball game he's involved with is a tough watch. Because uh, he really he loves his offensive timeouts, he loves his slow walks to the pitcher's mound. It's like, I think I guess he's one of those like uh, grumpy old dudes who doesn't like that they're putting in rules to shorten the games, and so he's trying to sh to extend the game as long as he can. I don't know, but 
That guy sucks, man. I I mean, he's a phenomenal coach. What he's doing at LSU is a, he's doing great stuff. I mean, he's clearly elite, but man, that guy sucks to watch coach baseball. Um, but anyways, he said after the game that Hagen Smith was as good as any, you know, basically as good as any pitcher he's been around in his career. And he was like, man, I really wish that we could face him again because it would really make our team better. It'd be good for our team to face a guy like that. And uh, LSU doesn't have a Hagen Smith. Nobody has a Hagen Smith. But what LSU does have is a couple big leaguers, a couple future stars. I mean, Luke Holman, we'll talk about that a little bit later, of just how important it is to rise to the occasion and beat a guy like that. Uh, that's a big deal. I mean, obviously they didn't give him a loss. But for Arkansas to show up the way they did against Luke Holman, uh, that's a huge test for your team that Arkansas, again, continues to pass. Um, but before we really dive into each game, I do want to just take a quick look back at some of our keys going into the weekend last week. Some of the big questions I had to ask, uh, for one, I just wanted to know was, is it baseball season? Like, are, are we now there yet? Because I felt like the Auburn series was a fun one back and forth. Arkansas gets the job done on the road, but it didn't feel like everyone was watching. Like even among the Arkansas fan base, you hop on Twitter and you're seeing a lot of must, a lot of SMU, a lot of whatever, which like, you know, is what it is. I mean, obviously there's a lot going on in the world of sports. I mean, we had the spring scrimmage on Saturday. There's plenty of stuff always going on with Arkansas athletics. So I don't have a problem with it, but I just didn't feel like it was really baseball season last week. And that was kind of when I thought it would become baseball season. Uh, today, uh, May, April 1st, April fools for those who celebrate. Um, it's definitely baseball season. And I think that was apparent to anyone who was like at the park, like the energy at the park was definitely different. I thought the crowds were awesome. Uh, just going crazy. I mean, arguing balls and strikes even when they don't need to. Uh, I thought it was just like a fun atmosphere. It felt a little bit different inside the park. And then when I checked Twitter, it felt like every person I follow was either tweeting about the game, retweeting stuff about the game. Uh, you see like uh, big accounts like Big Donkey and D1 Baseball and like all these dudes posting stuff, college baseball, Nash or Central or whoever. They're all posting clips of Arkansas. And part of that was being Thursday night, you're playing on ESPN2, back and forth game against the national champs, two big fan bases, but also just feel like we're kind of at that time of year. It's now April. We're moving. I think people kind of realize something's happening with this team at this point. And uh, for those that, I mean, I mean, look, I'm not knocking casual fans when I say this, but I feel like if you are a casual baseball fan about now is when you start really tapping in. But uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the diehards have been there all the time, but I feel like that's like the silent majority it's nice to see, as weird as it sounds, it's nice to see those casual fans start to get involved and start realizing, hey, like, we'll, we'll tune into this baseball team. And for some people, they might tune in just in the postseason. You know, maybe this year's team, with them being number one and it clearly being a, a potentially special group, maybe that gets people to jump on board a little bit. But overall, for the weekend, I feel like that was uh, we got that question resolved. It is absolutely baseball season, and it was good to see. Uh, number two, the could be a question was like Arkansas's bullpen. How are they going to respond after not a bad week against Auburn? I mean, they won, they won two of three. Uh, a few a few guys in the bullpen had huge appearances, huge clutch outings, especially in those first two games. Uh, but then obviously, you know, you know, it hit the fan a little bit in, in Saturday's game against Auburn. And uh, Gabe Gackle in particular had a little bit, like his first real, you know, struggle in the SEC. Uh, I wanted to see how all those, like just the group as a whole would respond as far as the in and the individual pieces a plus, man. It's hard to ask for much more. I feel like that might have been the story of the weekend, honestly, was how good Arkansas's bullpen was. Uh, Will McIntyre was Will McIntyre. Gabe Gackle was Gabe Gackle. He came back and was awesome. It was, it was one of his one of his better outings of the year, honestly. Um, and just coming into a tie game in the eighth inning and getting it into extra innings, getting it to Stone Hewlett, who made, I, I guess he faced two hitters and he struck out two hitters. How about that? I saw they had him up and moving in Thursday's or in Saturday's game. So it's like he almost threw three straight days. Uh, but Stone Hewlett continues to be nails out of the bullpen. Those guys that I just mentioned with Mill Will McIntyre, Gabe Gackle, uh, Cody Frank, I'll also throw in there because I felt like he had a nice little return to form with three score or three innings of one run ball on Saturday. Uh, like the guys we know, and Stone Hewlett is as crazy as it sounds, is like become one of those top guys in the Arkansas bullpen that we know is going to show up. Those top four guys, we knew they were good going into the weekend. We confirmed that they're still good. Uh, I thought the big development, I mean, Maybe not the biggest of the weekend, but Christian Fouch coming into game two. Uh, bases loaded, nobody out. Uh, gives him a quick sack fly, but then ends up getting six outs of, by facing five guys. Gets a huge double play ball to get out of that inning. Comes back the next inning, gets a nasty strikeout with the splitter. Uh, you know, 
two in, only faced five hitters, retired them all, got six outs with those five hitters. Uh, not like the biggest sample size where it's like, all right, we can wrap it up. Christian Fouch is a star. But, you know, it's really easy to see the vision of what he could do for this Arkansas bullpen. You see him come in 97 and 99, and it's an easy 98, 99. Like, he just comes in there and just lets it eat. Um, I feel like there might be more juice in there. Like, I think he might touch 100 down the stretch. I really wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you think about what he might look like next year, too. Really hard not to be excited about Christian Fouch and what he can do. And uh, that splitter, everyone talks about it, man. Like, I mentioned it here a few times. Uh, Hunter Holland was the first guy I can remember saying something about it, and it was last fall when Holland first got on campus, uh, like a week into his time at Arkansas. And I was just like, hey, is there anybody, you know, you're, you're at a new place, anyone that sticks out to you? And he didn't say Hagen Smith. He didn't say Brady Tiger. He didn't say whoever. He was just like, oh, this freshman Christian Frouch has a splitter. That's just gross, man. I wish I had it. Uh, every player, I mean, y'all have seen every player that I, that I ask, hey, is there a pitch on the team that you wish you had? Everybody's like, would love to have that Fouch splitter, man. They, that's like kind of their thing. Uh, we've seen guys with weird pitches be awesome for Arkansas. I mean, Kevin Cops is obviously the most prominent example of this with his gyro cutter, whatever. Um, but we see guys, I mean, Jake uh, Jacob Kostyshak, who I compared Jake Faraday to a little bit, he had a little bit of that. It wasn't like a splitter, but that little heavy sink fastball uh, and Christian Fouch has a little bit of that with the splitter behind it. Look, I don't think he's going to be a like starter for Arkansas ever. I think he's more going to be in that high leverage six, seven, eight inning role. But man, he looks he looked really good. I I feel like that's a reliable formula. I don't think they're going to ask too much of him. But with him, with what he does, it's pretty simple. If you throw ninety nine and have a good secondary pitch to go behind it. You can get a lot of hitters out at pretty much any level of baseball. So Christian Fouch, really good to see him get thrown into a situation like that and just kind of sink or swim, and he swims. How, how about that? And uh, But perhaps the biggest development from this bullpen came in Game 3 on Saturday. So about a, a little over a week ago, Dave Van Horn said, the freshman Hunter Dietz, who many of you have been wondering about, there's been comments about him like every week, uh, going into the year, going into the offseason, he was Arkansas's top-rated pitching prospect, uh, depending on where you look. Some had Gacka a little bit higher. Some had him higher. But both of those guys were talking like top 50 in the country, uh, top 10 in their class, draft class-wise. Um, just big-time freshman arms. Uh, from a pure stuff standpoint, as good as any you'll see. I mean, Hunter Dietz, was, his, his stuff was about 90. He was about 93, 95 in this past weekend's outing. He's going to reach a little bit higher than that. He's got a little bit more in the tank there. You'll see him get up to that 97, 98 mile an hour range when his when he's really and from the left side too, and he's a big, strong kid, looks the part. Like it's very easy to see why he was a blue chip prospect and why he was highly regarded. Um, he had not made his season debut yet, but about a week ago, Dave Van Horn said he was about seven to ten days out, and uh, you know he he also threw a little comment earlier in the week that I overlooked, and he said we're gonna have to make some decisions because we got to get someone on the roster. You know, we got to make some room on this roster to get some extra arms in there. And I honestly just kind of brushed past it and didn't really know what he was talking about. Uh, I mean, I definitely didn't think Hunter Dietz was going to make his debut against LSU, especially with Arkansas State playing on Tuesday and bomb right there. I was like, that feels like, I mean, they did the same thing with Ben Bybee, had him start a midweek game to kind of get his feet wet. I thought for sure you'd see something similar for Hunter Dietz. Not only did Arkansas pitch him against LSU, they brought him in seven to five eighth inning of, of the final game of the series where it's like kind of a setup situation, set up, put the game away type of situation, and Arkansas brings in Hunter Dietz. Um, we asked DVH about it, and he it was basically as simple as like they really wanted to pitch him against LSU so that they would have him available next weekend against Ole Miss. And if they, they felt like if they pitched him Tuesday, you're probably not going to have because I believe Arkansas has a number of Thursday through Saturday series. If you pitch him on Tuesday, you're probably not going to have him for the first two games of that series plus with him working his way back uh, from a minor procedure. Uh, that was the, That's the term that we were given. I can't. It was like a, I feel like it was a stress fracture somewhere, but it wasn't even, I don't know, I, it wasn't a, a big deal. I um, mean, he's been throwing for a while now. But, hey, you know, everybody had been wondering about Hunter Dietz. When's he going to come back? There he was. He came back, uh, got two outs, did leave with the bases loaded, had a little bit of tough luck. So I believe the first hitter he faced in his college career was freaking Tommy White. Uh, which is just hilarious to me. But uh, he, he faces Tommy White, issues like a five or six pitch walk. Um, and then I want to say the next pitch, or like one of the next the, the next few pitches he threw was a was an infield single uh, that just kind of like 
was a chopper that kind of got over the head of Ben McLaughlin and uh, ends up going into shallow right field. So you have a little bit of a tough situation where it's first and second, no out right away. And you're also facing the heart of the LSU lineup. Uh, but he comes back and gets a huge strikeout against Jared Jones, uh, who, you know, Jared Jones is one of LSU's guys. He got like 10 home runs on the year. Uh, first and second, no out. Not a fun guy you want to face there. But he comes through, gets a strikeout, uh, gets a ground out, gets Hayden Stravinsky to ground out the shortstop. Now, I want to mention something real quick. Uh, Viva Loy kind of bobbled the ball at first. He had to go to his left a good bit and didn't quite field it cleanly, but he's able to knock it down and then recovers and throws to first. It, you know, at, off the bat, you're thinking, oh, is that a double play ball? Uh, probably would have been a tough double play. He bobbles a little bit, but, but stays with it and goes to first. And Dave Van Horn mentioned it after the game where he was like, that play right there, that's the entire mentality of our team. He didn't give up on that ground ball. He didn't, you know, he wasn't like all worried that he didn't make the play. He just like attacked it and just went and got it. Uh, and I thought that was kind of funny that DVH really liked that because anytime there's a double play not turned, turned, uh, anytime there's a double play that's not turned when it turned when it could, uh, I always am like kind of looking for DVH's reaction because I know like a little stuff like that drives him nuts. But uh, he loved that Vahiva, you know, didn't give up on the play and still got a huge second out for Arkansas. Uh, and then Josh Pearson, the lefty, was hit by a pitch, uh, which is a little bit tough. But then, you know, and I believe, yeah, it was, it was a one two count, too. So you hit a lefty one-two count. A little bit of a tough break there. Uh, but DBH said after the game, they felt like Dietz threw the ball well, had some swing and miss stuff. I mean, like, like I said, his fastball was 93-95. The strikeout he got was on his big slider. Uh, you know, I think he's got clearly the stuff to help Arkansas. I think mentally it tells you how they feel about him, that they brought him into that situation and that he didn't blow it, frankly. Um, and by the way, Will McIntyre, he should probably buy him buy him lunch or something because Will McIntyre comes in and strikes out Mac Bingham, who had two home runs in the game. So it's like, you know, that was kind of two long home runs in the game. So it's a huge situation, and clearly, you know, this is the right move to go to McIntyre there. He gets the big strikeout, which for, keeps a zero on Hunter Dietz's career stat line. Uh, he's now on pace to be Ar Arkansas's ERA leader all time, so good for him. But big picture, he threw, he threw 20 pitches, 11 for strikes, uh, I thought it was actually a really encouraging debut, and I think also it's he's going to get better. Like it's, he, that was his first career outing coming back from injury. Uh, the fact that he was able to get some big outs there in the eighth inning for Arkansas says a lot about him and how they feel about him. But keep an eye on that kid moving forward because this is not the last time you're going to see him pitch. Uh, I feel like he's got a lot left in the tank there, and now the left field battle. So, or I guess I should say just position battles overall. Because that was one of the other questions I had going into the weekend is like, are we going to get any clarity on left field, third base, like catcher DH, how we feeling? Not really, to be honest with you. So Will Edmondson, although he, you know, Will Edmondson started all three games in left field. That's actually not true. Let me make sure. He, Will Edmondson came in to pinch hit. Uh, Ross Lovich got the start in game two against Luke Holman. But Edmondson came in to pinch hit at some point and ended up having three at-bats. Um he got the bulk of the work, got the starts on Thursday and Saturday, had a really big performance on Saturday. He was the he was my quick hits uh, gorilla of the game. He also got the actual gorilla, so there's your gorilla ball update. Um, went three for three, had a double, uh, drove in a couple runs, scored a couple, or scored one. Uh, Will Edmondson, again, just continues to overachieve, man. This is a dude who didn't even play at the JUCO level as a freshman. Like you can go back and look at his numbers. He had like 280 with zero home runs. He was not an everyday player at the JUCO level as a freshman. Uh, comes back the next year, hits 454, has like 13 home runs. Uh, clearly took a massive step forward, stole a ton of bases. Uh, but even still, like, you know, was not a guy who was high on everyone's radar. He wasn't like Arkansas had to compete with everyone in the country to get him. And uh, frankly, I'll be honest with you, I remember asking Will Edmondson himself in the fall, I was like, hey, did you come here, you know, to Arkansas with like, oh, I have to start? Or was it just kind of like, let me see what I can do at this level? And he basically told me it was the latter, where it was like, you know, he was confident in his abilities. He's always felt like he could play. And uh, he always felt like he had a chip on his shoulder. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, always, always confident. But he didn't come to Arkansas being like, oh, I got to start. He was just kind of like, hey, we'll see what happens. And here he is. I mean, He's been as productive as any Arkansas hitter in SEC play. I mean, that's not true, but uh, he's he's been right there in the middle of the Arkansas, you know, hitting stats. He's been performing in SEC play. Had a couple had had three huge hits against Auburn last weekend. He's been driving in runs, been scoring runs, been finishing rallies, starting rallies. Uh, again, he's not going to like blow you away. He's not like a super toolsy guy. 
Uh, I believe he just has the one home run on the year, which he hit last Tuesday. Uh, but it seems like Will Edmondson is is right back there in front where like there's been th- like seven different points this year where moments where I'm like, all right, Jason Jones is a left fielder and it's kind of done. Like he's your left fielder. Then there were times where Ross Lovich kind of came on really strong there and you're like, all right, Ross Lovich experience. Okay, that's your left fielder right there. Now it's time for Will Edmondson. He's having his moment where it's like, all right, hey, that might just that might be your left fielder. Like it's solved now. I'm going to assume it won't be that simple. I think we're still going to have some moving and shaking there. Uh, Jason Jones did not play at all this past weekend and did not play on Tuesday. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know why. I don't know if, you know, if, if it's like simply an on-field thing, if there's more going on behind the scenes. I really don't know. And it's not our place to speculate. I just have a hard time believing that they don't think Jason Jones can help them win baseball games. Um, but we will see how that shakes out. I mean, I mentioned the Tuesday game against Arkansas State. Maybe that's a nice little situation to get Jason back in the fold, see if he can make something work. Maybe sitting for a week or two, maybe that's what he needed mentally to kind of reset. I mean, we hear that all the time. I don't know if it's true or not, but we'll see. Um, but I guess we should also mention DH, Jack Wagner, who made his return last week, uh, hit a home run in the midweek game, and it was kind of awesome. Uh Comes back, gets the starting nod game one at DH against a left-handed pitcher and uh, comes with a huge game-tying home run, and I believe it was the fourth inning. Uh, I believe that was the only hit Jack Wagner had. But, hey, good to see Jack Wagner getting in there, getting in the mix, contributing. I know there were a lot of you that were very concerned. I do also want to point out, DVH revealed later that he was banged up a little bit. He wasn't completely healthy the whole time. It wasn't like they just benched him and were like, hey, F off. Uh, he was He was banged up a little bit, and there were just – you know, a lot of guys there, they're kind of a little bit of a log jam at that position. Uh, but it seems like Jack Wagner's kind of back in the mix. Uh, didn't start the following two games. Uh, I guess the next day, Nolan Souza got to start and did not have a great day. And then the next day, you had Hudson White there at DH while Ryder Helfrick catched, caught. <laughs> um, but, anyways, I don't, I, you know, I don't think it, the DH is a super lockdown position. I think they'll probably platoon it if I had to guess. Uh, I mentioned Nolan Souza, the lefty, getting the start against a righty Holman. Uh, yeah, I bet they. I bet they just platoon that position for the time, you know, for the time being. Who knows if maybe Jason Jones, maybe that's where he can work in. We'll see. Um, maybe Ryder Helfrick continues to get some looks there. I assume he will. Helfrick will continue to catch some games on the weekend. And I thought Helfrick did a really had a really strong performance on Saturday. He went one for four, but he hit the ball really hard. He had a hundred and seven mile an hour single. He had like a hundred and eight mile an hour fl- foul ball the pitch before. Uh, he had a two fly balls to deep right center field, both of which advanced a runner from second to third. I feel like Helfrick is kind of settled in at this point and uh, only got the one start this weekend, but I think he's a the guy they feel really good about. We'll see if they start experimenting with that a little bit. Maybe Hudson White is your answer at DH. Who knows? But Hudson White has also had a really nice little, little stretch here. Um, I do also want to, before we, we, we just, well, I guess we'll, well, let's just talk about the games individually first. So game one, Arkansas wins seven to four. We'll just do a quick little rundown. Uh, Hagen Smith, six innings, 10 strikeouts, gave up five hits, which was a season high. You can make an argument. This was the worst Hagen Smith outing of the year, or at least since game one against James Madison. Uh, gives up back-to-back home runs in the fourth inning, I believe it was. And uh, that was a little bit of a jarring moment there where Tommy White gets a breaking ball and just kind of hits it in the right spot. Didn't really square it up or anything. Uh, but it just kind of finds the right spot with the wind, gets into the bullpen, and then Hayden Travinsky hit a home run opposite field on a fastball that really didn't need any help at all. Uh, and then just like that on back-to-back pitches, Arkansas was down 2-1. to one. Uh, That seemed to lock Hagen in a little bit. He was he was great after that. I mean, he was great before that, and he was great during that. It really wasn't a big deal. Uh, but it was just kind of funny where it's like there was a little bit of a high-tense moment there where you're like, Arkansas has got their ace on the bump, and now all of a sudden they're down 2-1. Will this offense rise to the occasion? Like, what's going to happen? And then I mentioned Jack Wagner hits the home run and tie it up, like, right after. Just another example of Arkansas answering that bell every time. Uh, But, yeah, so every single spot in the Arkansas lineup reached base in this game one against LSU. Peyton Stovall had a couple hits. Peyton Stovall was unbelievably good this weekend. Uh, Vahiva Loy goes one for two and works a career high three walks. So that was nice to see. Um, Kendall Diggs had the big swing of the night, who was having a rough go of an 0 for 4 with two strikeouts, and then comes up with, against Gavin Guidry uh, and, and jumps all over an 0-2 fastball and, and hits it out of the park. And that was kind of 
the moment of the, of game one for sure. The moment that everyone was talking about afterwards, every, the clip everyone was tweeting out. So uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Will McIntyre comes uh, ends up getting not the save because Stone Hewlett, Stone Stonehealer gets the save because he came in and faced one batter, struck him out. Will McIntyre gave up a couple runs, which was like the first time in like a month he had done that. Uh, so two runs on four hits and two and two thirds. Struck out eight hitters. Just unreal. Every out Will McIntyre got was a strikeout. And, uh, you know, again, high stress situation. Really good to see him kind of rise to that occasion as he continues to do. And then game t- game two was the fun one where he goes to extra innings, back and forth the whole time. Uh, and the, the the story of this game to me was just the way that Arkansas jumped all over an ace pitcher because I believe that was one of the questions that I had going into the weekend. I think I misspoke completely whenever I talked about the left field battle. That was not one of my questions. Uh, could Arkansas handle a true ace? They handled this one. I mean, I, you know, when I say handled, uh, I believe, let me look, look at his final line. It was the shortest start of the year for Luke Holman. I know that. Four and a third, five hits, three runs, five walks also. This is a dude that came into the game with eight walks. And uh, that was another kind of key I was looking forward to this weekend is because LSU pitching staff, they walk a lot of guys. Arkansas was near the bottom of the SEC in walks going into the weekend. Now, all of a sudden, they're leading the SEC in conference play for walks, which is pretty unreal. Um, but, yeah, Luke Holman, who doesn't walk a ton of guys at all, they were really able to make him work, force him to five walks, five hits. And uh, they had a, they just kind of kind of broke, through, bro- broke free there finally in the fourth inning because uh, it had been a little bit of a frustrating start for Arkansas. They had runners on, and the, they, they got a leadoff double from Peyton Stovall to start the game. They end up straining that. They get runners on in the first and second. They get runners on in the second and third. Uh, and then I was finally in the fourth inning, uh, they finally were able to make it work. Uh, what was the Who had the big? I believe it was Ty Wilmsmeyer. Yeah, Ty Wilmsmeyer it was the one who, again, had a massive weekend. He was the first one to have a run-scoring hit for Arkansas against Luke Coleman. Goes the other way, ropes a double down the right field line. Uh, Stovall follows with an RBI ground out to make it work. And then Ben McLaughlin with a huge two-out two, uh, double down the right field line to kind of give Arkansas that third run, which ended up being a big one. In this game, all the runs mattered. Um, so you so then they they forced Luke Holman out of the game with one out in the fourth inning, uh, or I guess in the fifth inning. They he came back the next, and it really felt like Arkansas. It was like they took LSU's best punch and they were about to just blow these dudes out. Um, but then they just did not. And LSU LSU turned to their best bullpen arm and Griffin Herring, lefty, who uh, basically just shut Arkansas down. If I'm being honest with you, goes four and two thirds, gives up three hits, strikes out eight, zero runs. Really gave our, I mean, gave LSU a chance to win this game, and uh, he went as long as he possibly could. He threw seventy pitches out of the bullpen. Finally, eventually forced LSU to go to Thatcher Hurd or Thatcher Turd for those who uh, who, who who subscribe to that theory. And uh, he just gave up the lead right away. I mean, it was three to three. I mean, we didn't have a lead actually. It was tenth inning. Uh, just went ahead and just gave it up right away. Hits Will Edmondson with a pitch, if I remember correctly, or actually no, Will Edmondson reached via error. Uh, on Michael Braswell, and uh, that turned out to be all Arkansas needed because Hudson White r- roped a double down the left field line, and that was all she wrote. Uh, even if Will Edmondson hadn't scored all the way from first, you felt like Arkansas was about to crush there. Uh, and they, had, like I said, they took LSU's best punch and answered back. But you know, credit to LSU for just riding their best arm and just being like, "Hey, we're gonna win or lose the series right here. Like this is it." And uh, they lost the series, and they lost that game. They lost all the games. Uh, but I did. I thought that 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 was a stressful moment for Arkansas, man. Like, obviously they end up sweeping, so it's like it's easy to look back and be like, oh yeah, like it was fine. Like they were going to win no matter what. But if Arkansas had dropped that game too, especially having to use Gackle, they had used McIntyre for sixty-two pitches the day before. Uh, used got a really good outing from Christian Fouch. Got a good outing from Gabe Gackle. Used Stone Hewlett again. So it's like if they had not been able to get a win in that series. You would have been real nervous going into that game three. I know I definitely would have been. I'd have been like, I don't, I don't feel great about this. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was good to see Gabe Gackle and Christian Fouch and Stone Hewlett rise to that occasion. Uh, Gackle, in particular, in particular, I felt like his performance was big, especially just because LSU had their best bullpen arm on the mound, and so it's nice to bring in your guy. And we're both. It's kind of like we're we're putting it on the table here. We're just gonna see who who's who's bigger here. Let's just see who's bigger. And uh, I felt like Arkansas, you know, they showed up. And Griffin Herring, Arkansas wasn't able to get to him. But uh, 
man, you know, it just is what it is. It's like you're not going to be able to crush against every pitcher. You just got to kind of outlast them, and that's what Arkansas did in that one. And uh, their work that they did against Luke Holman early in the game, a Luke Holman who came into the le- into the game with a 0.78 ERA, um, obviously didn't have his best stuff. He's not as bad as he looked on on Friday night. Like that that dude is gonna is gonna shut down a lot of SEC teams, and so I think that performance is going to age pretty well moving forward. Uh, and then Sunday's game, so Gage uh, Gage Jump, not Gage Wood. I called him Gage Wood last week too. Gage Jump was like kind of the matchup that I didn't love for Arkansas. And in the early on, early going, you can kind of see it seemed like you know just lefty. Obviously, Arkansas has a lot of lefties. Uh, but the lefty who fills the strike zone, mixes speeds, and he was up to 95 with his fastball. His stuff was electric. Early on, I was kind of like, man, I just don't know if this is going to work. And then Arkansas just worked his pitch count, worked his pitch count. He ends up leaving the game with 30 and two-thirds innings at 77 pitches, but it seemed like he ran out of gas at about the 60-pitch mark. That's about when Arkansas broke him down, uh, and they make it work with four straight two-out singles, the first of which came from Will Edmondson. Uh, who, again, just continues to be right here in that mix. Uh, Ty Wilmsmeyer follows with a huge single to drive in a couple runs, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, Peyton Stovall follows with a single, and that was the final pitch that that uh, Gage jumped through. It was, just a, it was just a big, like, there's no margin for error against Arkansas, really, and it was good to see them make a team pay for mistakes and to kind of you know do what DBH loved about it is that they were working the pitch counts. None of the LSU's three starters, now Javin Coleman was a little bit of a spot starter situation, but none of LSU's three starters even had a chance to work deep into the game uh, just because of how much they were having to work early in those games. And Arkansas wasn't getting runs early, but you saw they were able to kind of bring that pitcher to his breaking point and then break him. Uh, and, you know, most of the time you would like for it to be a huge grand slam or a huge three-run home run or whatever. Uh, Arkansas just kind of chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. And they had a couple huge swings late. Like I mentioned the Kendall Diggs home run earlier. Uh, Peyton Stovall is the one who kind of came through with a big swing today. Uh, Arkansas took the lead 5-4, to four, their first lead on game three, on a weird, like, check swing from Ty Wilmsmeyer, where our boy that I just mentioned, Will Edmondson, scores from third on a really, really close play. A little bit of a weird play, but that's how Arkansas gets their lead. There was like a long review. The momentum was already starting to shift to the Arkansas dugout. I mean, they had just taken the lead, obviously. When they came back from that review, the first pitch Peyton Stovall sees left on left just rips it over the right center field wall. And that had to feel like the ultimate gut punch. Um, I mean, that just that was the series right there, man. LSU ended up getting a home run from Mac Bingham, who I mentioned earlier had the two home runs later to cut it to one or cut it to a two run lead. But Arkansas, all weekend long, that was kind of the theme, is like it would be back and forth, tight, tense situations, and then Arkansas would just land a big knockout blow. And anytime LSU landed similar blows, Arkansas would just come right back. It didn't seem to affect them as much. Uh, and, you know, part of that's playing at home, being at a program that, that's been in these situations before. Some of those guys I mentioned, like a Peyton Stovall, like a Kendall Diggs, have been there before, seen this SEC competition. They're not they're not afraid of it. Um but it was just really good to see Arkansas's like, I like I said earlier, competitive nature come out, and uh, it, it was it was big time stuff, man. So look, let's take a quick little look at some of the numbers of where Arkansas's offense is in SEC play. So for the year, Arkansas's hitting around two seventy nine. Like they've been around the same statistically all year, just kind of like very average uh, for the most part. Uh, in SEC play, Arkansas is now tenth in the SEC in batting average at two fifty one. But here's what I like. They're seventh in slugging at 464, and they're eighth in on-base percentage at 368, right below Alabama, who's seventh there at 369. So they're middle of the pack, pretty much, in slugging percentage and on-base percentage, uh, which are kind of like the two, you know, like that, like batting average, slugging, and on-base. That's like the holy trinity there. Arkansas is middle of the pack in all of it, uh, right? And they're seventh, and they're eighth in scoring too, right behind Alabama, two runs behind them. They are dead in the middle of the pack, which may not excite you. You may not be jumping for joy as I read those stats. But for with this pitching staff and with how Arkansas kind of started the year offensively and really started SEC play, it's pretty encouraging. And it's like, again, the bar is not that high for this offense. I mean, I mentioned on, on a previous podcast, the 2017 Florida team, which if you really go back and look at that Florida team, very similar to Arkansas in terms of, the strength of their team was just three future MLB pitchers, three legitimate starters, 
uh, some experience in the bullpen, some a, a nice little mix of young talent and older guys that they count on in the bullpen. That Florida lineup in that year hit 256. Just not a great offense at all. Even in Omaha, they were just stringing it together. I think they hit like 220 in overtime or in, in Omaha. They were like 212 in the College World Series or something crazy like that. I'm not saying Arkansas can do that, nor should they. I mean, this offense has potential to be much better than that, uh, much better, frankly, than, than what they've been. But again, you're starting to kind of at least see the vision of what they can be, which is just wear you down, work your walks, make you pay, hit a huge three-run home run, uh, score in spurts here and there. And, you know, with this pitching staff Arkansas has got, that's about as much as you can ask for. I also do want to mention Arkansas. So they entered the 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 weekend uh, dead last in the SEC in strikeouts, which is like the good version of that, where they strike out fewer than anyone in the SEC. They are now ninth in the league in that regard. They've got 71 strikeouts. Kentucky leads the league with 58 uh, or, or trails the league. I don't know, whatever term you want to use here. Um, but Arkansas is like, safely in the bottom echelon there for strikeouts still, despite facing the team that strikes out more than anyone in, L- in LSU. Arkansas now leads the SEC in walks during conference play, which is kind of like what we've been waiting on. We figured that this team would walk more, strike out more, hit for power. Uh, early on, they weren't really hitting for power and they weren't really striking out, but they also weren't drawing a ton of walks. And so it, we're starting to see this team kind of progress or regress to the mean a little bit in some key areas. But uh, honestly, I'm very encouraged by that walk number because I felt like there's been a change since SEC play started where Arkansas has been a little bit more selective at the plate, uh, and that selection has led to a lot of more walks and has led Arkansas to be able to take advantage of when they finally do get a mistake, like a, like Kendall Diggs getting an 0-2 fastball up and in. He makes him pay. Peyton Stovall jumps all over the first pitch. Like Those swings right there change games. And Arkansas has done a really good job at looking for those swings and just taking their walks when they're presented. Like when they're facing a pitcher that, you know, you need to get out of the game early, they're making them work. Uh, I feel like Arkansas's offense is starting to take some strides, not at a drastic rate. Like they're not crushing by any means. They're not one of the better offenses in the country, uh, but they are starting to take some strides to at least be the perfect situation for what this pitching staff needs, which is not that much. This pitching staff doesn't need a ton of help. Uh, but they needed a little bit this weekend, and Arkansas was able to provide it. Um, and then in SEC play, Arkansas still leads the league in uh, in ERA. The margin is not as drastic. They're at 278. Vanderbilt's at 304. The next closest team is Kentucky at 381. Kentucky, by the way, we'll talk about a little bit about later. They're also leading the league in opposing batting average, which Arkansas had been leading for so long. Like I forgot that it was even an option that anyone else could. Uh, Arkansas also strikeouts in SEC play. Y'all will like this. So Vander or Texas A&M is second at 92. Vanderbilt's third at 91. Florida's fourth at 88. Uh, or LSU's fourth, I should say. Florida's fifth at 84. Those are your top right there. And then Arkansas, 110. A good little 18 strikeouts more than anyone. So that's two per game. Uh, Arkansas is on a different level as a pitching staff than the rest of these SEC teams. And I would imagine that as the season progresses, that margin will probably, I mean, it's not going to be drastic, but in a lot of those key areas, I don't see a lot of teams catching up to Arkansas. There's really only, like you see in these stats, like only a few that are even in striking distance of them. Uh, so still very encouraging stuff for the most part. Um, I also do want to, let's see if I can get through. Let's see if I can pull up Arkansas's just overall stats here real quick. So Arkansas... Leading the team now is Peyton Stovall at a 364 batting average. He's now got four home runs and 17 RBI. Like If you looked at his line, it'd honestly be kind of hard to tell that he missed the first three weeks of the season. He's slugging 636. This is a guy that is a true freshman, slugged 425, uh, ended up hitting that year 295 despite his early struggles. But at, even after all his long run in Omaha and kind of figuring it out down the stretch, he still only slugged 425. And then his sophomore year where he was banged up the entire time was under 400 from a slugging percentage standpoint. So we kind of knew that Peyton Stovall was better than what we had seen from his career for the first two years. Just in a nutshell, we knew like, hey, once this guy gets it going, he'll be a little bit more consistent. He'll be better. Um, now there's still, I mean, it's early. There's due for some regression, but I don't think I had him slugging over 600 at any point. Like he just seems like a lot more powerful of a bat 
than frankly, like I think any of us realized he would be this year, or at least right away. Um, and I mean, man, he's he's a very intriguing draft prospect, man. Because you see that dude playing second base, he's lights out, man. Like I know, obviously, uh, I don't think Arkansas is ever going to have a middle infield as good as Jalen Battles and Robert Moore. Like that, I just think that combination is special, so special that you have Peyton Stovall playing first base. But I think, man, like Peyton Stovall, you watch him play second base. He's right there with whoever you think the best second baseman at Arkansas is defensively. He's been right up there with him, man. He makes every play, makes plays that are difficult, look easy. He just brings it week in and week out, man. It's been really fun to watch him play on, you know, both sides of the ball here. Um, but he's the only guy, at least in the everyday lineup, that is hitting over 300. Should mention Peyton Holt is still hitting 327, but he did not play at all this weekend. Why? Nobody really knows at this point, but, you know, it is what it is. We'll just have to kind of wait and see what happens. But, uh, yeah, an SEC play, though. Peyton Stovall is hitting 382 up from his 346 overall. Uh, Hudson White, if would y'all believe me if I told you he was hitting 323? He had the big walk-off on Friday. Uh, he's been swinging the bat really well lately. Really been encouraged by what, it, what we've been seeing out of him. It seems like he's pretty settled in there, hitting the ball hard, uh, hitting the ball to all fields too, which is nice. Will Edmondson's hitting 313 during SEC play. Not a huge sample size, only 5 of 16, but he's right there up there in the mix. And uh, Vahiva Aloy, 281 in SEC play. He's got the three home runs, driven in six runs. Vahiva Aloy is, is here. Like, he's arrived. Uh, I didn't even mention his home run that he had on Saturday. Uh, Tommy White hit a home run on the second pitch of the game. And then Vahiva Aloy just comes right back, hits a home run in the bottom of the first, to kind of get Arkansas back, get Arkansas going in that game. He brings so much to the table. I mean, he's been really good at short, only has one error on the year still, which is a product of the official score at Arkansas really giving him some lenience there. But he's been really good in the field. I mean, there's only been a few plays where you could even argue there's an error. Uh, been really good at the field in the field. And in SEC play, he's actually been more consistent than he was in non-conference play. Uh, nothing about Vahiva. He's now got seven walks, two hit by pitch, and six strikeouts. Uh, he got back to striking out a little bit this weekend. He struck out four times. But, I mean, he's been taking his walks, been a lot more patient at the plate, been doing some damage. When I look at Arkansas' SEC numbers, it's kind of interesting that Kendall Diggs is hitting 216 and Ben McLaughlin is hitting 200. Uh, so it's like, you know, whatever I just read you about Arkansas' stats as a team and kind of what they've done in SEC play and why we feel pretty good about it, that's without two of your best hitters unequivocally really doing a whole lot for you. I mean, Kendall Diggs does have the three home runs, nine runs driven in. He's been doing a lot of damage. His slug, I mean, he's slugging 568 in SEC play. Batting average still at 213, though, or 216, though. You expect both those guys to uh, progress a little bit more in that that regard. And, uh, you know, Spraglot's hitting 172. Ross Lovich hitting 200. Nolan Souza hitting 200. Like, none of those guys have been super great in SEC play. So I think there's still room for, you know, I think what Arkansas has done, like, I think it's pretty sustainable. And I think there's probably going to be some of these pieces are going to end up breaking out here soon, like we've seen with Vahiva Loy and Hudson White. Which, as you, if you listen to this program, you knew was coming because I've been telling y'all for weeks that those dudes are good and they were going to hit. Um, yeah, so just a lot of really encouraging signs when you just look at overall what Arkansas has been doing in SEC play. Um, before we get out of here, though, I do want to take a quick little tour around the SEC just because I know that's what we do around here. Uh, some of you may like it. Some of you may hate it. I don't know. But uh, I just feel like it's relevant, so I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, so obviously Arkansas gets the big sweep. They uh, beat LSU three, you know, three games out of three. You knew that one. Uh, Auburn goes on the road to A&M. And I said it last week, like whoever did Auburn's schedule really screwed them. That's, that's just a, op a brutal opening stretch to SEC play. Auburn hung around in this series, but they end up getting swept in College Station, uh, got walked off in game three. They lose game one, nine to seven. I think game two might have been a little bit lopsided, but it was a very, very competitive series. Auburn could have win just about any of those games. They don't. They end up getting swept. Another team that got swept that actually like really wasn't that bad is Missouri. They go to Vanderbilt and they lose like every game was like 3-2, 4-1, 5-4. Missouri's really not that bad, but they are, you know, they are 1 and 8 in SEC play, uh partly because they've had to face two of the top 5 teams in the country. It just kind of happens that way. Uh and frankly, they beat Kentucky and they're the only team that has beaten Kentucky so far. That Kentucky team, we'll get to them later. Nasty. Uh, Bama gets a big series win against South Carolina. Had a chance to go for the sweep, but South Carolina was able to win by one run on Sunday. No, Saturday. No, I think that was actually a – no, I think it was Saturday. 
Uh, anyways, South Carolina was able to avoid a sweep and salvage a game there at Tuscaloosa on the road. Uh, two really like above, like in the middle, not in the middle of the pack of the SEC, like whatever slightly above the middle of the pack is. That was a nice t- series to get a little bit of separation there. Uh, Georgia game one goes to Knoxville and run rolls those dudes sixteen to two. You're kind of thinking, oh wow, man, this Georgia team's coming off a big sweep. Now here they are. They I believe they swept Alabama. Now here they are at Tennessee, and they smack those dudes. Seemed like Wes Johnson and the boys figured it out. Uh, Tennessee comes back and wins both of the next two games. Uh, so, it's, you know, nice little competitive series there. Kent- or Tennessee's been in some lopsided SEC results. I mean, their, their series against Ole Miss, they won two out of three. The two they win were both run rule, one of which was like 15-1 to one or something like that. And then they lose game one to Georgia, 15-2. to two, uh, Or what did I just say, 16-2. to two. Uh, That was nuts. The best series of the weekend in terms of just a competitive, you know, nature, back and forth, Florida hosted Mississippi State. That's number six versus like number 17 or something like that. Really competitive series. The Bulldogs had a chance to win. They went into game one with a one-run lead in the ninth. They end up, or with a two-run lead in the ninth, they end up giving up three runs. So that's a really deflating loss there on the road at Florida. Florida takes game one, seven to six. Uh, I believe Mississippi State run ruled them in game two. If they didn't run rule them, it, like they they won twelve to two. I don't remember if it was actually like seven eighth inning or if it happened in the ninth inning. But uh, Mississippi State put it on them in that game too. And you're thinking, man, they could have just pulled out that game one. They'd have been fine. And then a pretty similar story plays out in game three, where I believe it was either tied. Let's see if I could pull it up. Yeah, I believe it was either tied or. Uh, Mississippi State, yeah, they had a one-run lead again going into the ninth inning, up 3-2, had a chance to close it out and get a huge series win. They end up giving up a two-run home run to Jack Caglione, and you're going home with a series loss. But that Mississippi State team, watch out for those cats. They're, they're going to come into Fayetteville or at some point. I guess it's way later in the year. They're 4-5 and five right now in SEC play, but I feel like that's not really indicative of how well they've really played. And uh, shout-out to Florida for being 16-11 and 11 overall. But six and three in SEC play and second in the SEC East and clearly one of the national title contenders. Um, so, you know, good for them there. And I believe, no, I said I didn't mention Kentucky goes on the road to Ole Miss. Honestly, dude, they just whipped these dudes. Game two was a little bit close, five to three. Uh, but game one, I feel like I, I feel like I remember seeing that was like a not super close game. Or maybe it's game one was five to three. Um Let's see, where, where's the next score here? Oh, yeah, and then Kentucky wins 17-9 to nine in game two there. Uh, I mean, just just whoop those dudes, man. On the road in Oxford, that's a statement series for Kentucky because, I mean, they had been – they swept Georgia to open SEC play, and it's which has turned out to be pretty good because Georgia's clearly a competent team. Like, that's an impressive sweep. Uh, then you take two of three against Missouri. So you're sitting there at five and one. And I think me and a lot of other people were kind of just waiting to see how long this would last. And not only is it lasting, Kentucky goes out there and sweeps Ole Miss. They're looking as dangerous as anyone. I mean, I mentioned that they were, you know, leading the SEC in opposing batting average. Their pitching staff has been dominant in SEC play. Uh, Man, that's a that's a that's a not going to be an easy road trip for Arkansas. I can't remember because it's it's coming up. It's in the next few weeks. That's going to end up being a a hotly contested matchup there and. We'll see, man. I mean, they also have a common opponent in Missouri, in uh, Murray State, uh, which I remember when I was doing like research for Murray State, watching them play Kentucky, and I'm like, well, if they did this against Kentucky, what are they going to do against Arkansas? You know, like they're not going to be able to do anything against Arkansas. Turns out that was a high, big time matchup there. So, Kentucky's been kind of one of the more fun stories in the SEC so far, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been it's been a lot of, a lot of intriguing stuff. Now they're eight and one in SEC play, leading the West or East, I should say. Uh, Vandy and Florida sitting right there at six and three. Tennessee at five and four. And South Carolina five and four. Georgia four and five. Missouri one and eight. Uh, Arkansas is one of two teams in the SEC West with a winning record in SEC play. Arkansas is looking there, look, looking pretty at eight and one. A and M, who has been really good in SEC play, after especially after dropping a series against Florida to start uh, a really competitive one. Now they're six and three after winning a series against Missouri and then sweeping Auburn. Uh, so they're in really good shape. That's going to be a team. That's going to be a tough road trip as well for Arkansas. And I think that's a team you guys should be paying attention to a lot because I think that's one of Arkansas's 
top contenders for SEC championship, national championship, whatever. Uh, their lineup is gross. Their pitching staff has been striking out a ton of dudes. Their, their, their starting pitching has been good. Texas A&M is going to be a problem, man, and uh, people need to be watching out for those guys. Bama and Mississippi State both sitting there at four and five in the middle of the pack. Ole Miss three and six after a rough weekend. And LSU, the defending national champions, two and seven, one game above Auburn at one and eight. So uh it's been it's been uh it's been a lot of a lot of interesting results that kind of make you check twice where you're like, wait a minute, LSU is two and seven in SEC play, but yeah, that's uh that's where we're at. So guys, uh it's been a fun episode. It's been a really fun weekend. I've been having a lot of fun here. Happy April Fool's Day to everyone. Uh, let me know how you guys feel about this Arkansas team. Any remaining questions you have left of like, I'm you know, this team, good, sweet, but can we do this? Or, you know, we're playing well, but I want to hear those buts. Like, what are y'all's issues with the teams? Or what do you like about the team? Just let me know. Uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in every week. We've had a nice little, we're growing a little bit. The Bombastic Podcast, our web is starting to get weaved a little bit. We're starting to, and I've seen a few people in these last week or so comment that oh man i just now found the channel like this is awesome really appreciate all our new listeners of course uh be sure to like and subscribe tell your buddies also for anyone that for anybody that listen to this that's not super tech savvy there's a little thing so if you're subscribed cool you're gonna like see my stuff in your feed a lot uh also i encourage you to do that if you have not and you can do that by simply just clicking on this video like there's a little subscribe button there there's also a little bell there if you just subscribe and you want to get notified every time we have a new episode, because I know that sometimes the schedule can kind of be up and down. Sometimes we do Monday, sometimes we do Tuesday, sometimes there's three in a week, sometimes it's Thursday, like whatever. If you want to be subscribed and know when we're going live, there's a little bell there. You can add on notifications for that. Uh, and also be sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, wherever it is you get your podcast. And check us out what we got going on at Natty State Sports on all social medias. We've been crushing it there. Uh, we had a nice little recap of the football scrimmage Curtis and I did. So if you're a football fan, go check that out on our main Natty State YouTube channel. You will have to go to the live section. A little bit of an annoying thing, but when we go live, those videos don't always publish to like our normal videos tab. You'll have to click the live. But uh, there was a nice pot of that nature cranked out by Curtis and I recapping the football scrimmage. And of course, the basketball guys, Curtis and Scotty, have been crushing it with the pot at the palace. Constant content coming in there. Had a big commitment from Josh Cohen. They were on it right away because they talked to Josh Cohen. They, you know, they they yeah, they, they've got a lot of stuff going on there at Pot at the Palace. So go check those guys out. I'm sure they're gonna continue to crush it this week. Gonna have a ton of stuff scheduled. Uh so be on the lookout for that and what all we've got going on here. We've also got written content coming out the wazoo. And uh it's been a lot of fun, guys. Tomorrow, Arkansas plays Arkansas State. And uh, I'm sure that'll be a thrilling in-state matchup. And then later in the week, they host Ole Miss at home. We will have a lot more to come on that and previewing that whole series, a lot more for you there. So stick around and stay tuned, and uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Woo pig, and happy April Fool's Day.